to In the Spotlight Show at Christian School. Today we are learning about Christianity with Mr. Patrick Evans, the former Archdeacon of Canterbury. Good morning, Mr. Evans. I'm Esther Louie. I'm nine years old, and I am a Christian. I'm Kate, and I'm nine years old. Good morning, Mr. Patrick Evans. I'm Tina Chang, and I'm nine years old. Hello. May I introduce myself first of all? I'm Patrick Evans, as you know. Uh, I'm a priest in the Church of England. And I'm so-called retired, but uh, very active in local church and community uh, where I live with my wife Jane and our Labrador Tiffy in a small town called Beminster, Beeminster, in the south of England, in the countryside and just 20 miles from the coast. Anyway, my last full-time ministry was as Archdeacon of Canterbury, working in three areas, but they were all linked. Firstly, uh, a certain amount of time and work was with or on behalf of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And then secondly, with others, I had the oversight of the great cathedral in Canterbury. And also then with others, with the local bishops, I uh, had a, a, a concern for looking after the, all the life of the many, many parishes in the diocese, in the area for which we had responsibility. So it was very busy, but very fulfilling and interesting. The cathedral had over a million visitors a year, and we employed over 200 people, from the stonemasons and the works department, who look after all the buildings, the librarians and the archives department, the specialists who worked with stained glass, the education department, the music and the choir, the vergers, the security people, the accountants, the administrators, and so on. And then over 500 volunteers, guides, and welcomers. Uh, the, the list is endless of the activities and the business of the cathedral. We had visitors from all over the world, and people of different faiths and of none. And especially we had visitors from the Anglican Communion, uh, as they came to Canterbury, feeling very much that Canterbury is the spiritual home of the Anglican Communion and, of course, of the Archbishop of Canterbury himself. We lived in a house next to the cathedral, all built in the 12th century. We lived with history all around us, and we loved having um, some bedrooms that were historically named Paradise, Heaven, Faith, Hope, and Charity. Well, now, thank you all so much, and Esther, Kate, and Tina especially, for these excellent questions. They're well thought out and very well presented. They're difficult questions and not easy to answer quickly. But they will, of course, be the sort of questions that Christians and others we can all ask and think about throughout our lives. Being a Christian is about the long-distance marathon. It's a long lifetime's journey with occasional sprints. How has God changed your life for a better? So, I think my life has changed for the better um, when I say that I'm less selfish, more open, and have become more aware of the needs of other people, of the world, and in my local communities. I think I've got a, a greater sense of wonder and thankfulness for the gift of life. And uh, I think I've become more welcoming and hospitable. I think I'm more at peace with myself um, and at one with other people. I'm certainly much more aware of and appreciative of the natural world of beauty and colour and patterns and designs. And God has so often worked through other people in giving me advice and encouragement, and sometimes, of course, challenged me or told me off. I think now I have a better balance between busyness and uh, stillness. When you feel angry or upset, sad or jealous, how does being a Christian help you 
manage your emotions? Well, all these emotions, well, anger, being upset, being sad, being jealous, they're very much the emotions that make up all of us. We're very human and we experience all these and many other emotions. They usually pass. Sometimes emotions of sadness or happiness indeed um, that pass by and then come back and we're sad again years later about something. We remember something and we're happy about something that happened a year or two ago. I think it's when some of the emotions don't leave us. We can't let go of them. And especially when it's to do with things like anger and jealousy. And we need help, I think, sometimes to let go of those sorts of emotions and to learn about forgiveness and forgiving, even if uh, in learning about forgiving, um, we can't forget what has happened. We need to understand ourselves a little better. And we need to understand, I think, other people when we're angry with them or we're jealous of them. And we need to look at our own lives and wonder quite what is going on. And for that, we need, I think, often to speak with other people, a trusted friend, um, a counsellor, a member of our family, a member, a senior member of the church. We need to be better sharers and uh, uh, better at talking with one another about our emotions, and especially when they drag us down. What advice would you give to people who don't yet believe in God? Well, my advice to people who don't believe in God, well, I don't think I would give them advice in the first place. I would befriend them. I wouldn't advise them and I certainly wouldn't lecture them. I'd respect them. I'd treat them um, with a certain amount of dignity and respect because they've got all their own experiences and values. For most of us, of course, it's through family and friendships, but doing things, working with others, perhaps in a common cause that naturally present opportunities to gently very gently, to talk about Christianity. God invites us to understand his ways. He never forces us to. Some Christians can be heavy-handed in talking about God, in talking about Jesus, and, and all it does is actually to drive people away. Be gentle with people but not ashamed to talk about God and talk about Jesus if the situation arises. I sometimes say to people, if they're genuinely making an inquiry about the Christian faith, about God, well, why not start with Jesus? Read about him, perhaps read some of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and read about those Gospels or get someone to talk with you about them and help you to understand them. But of course, sometimes um, actually helping people to understand a belief in God and follow the Christian way, if they look at our lives, not just what we say, but our actions, and sometimes our actions, how we behave, the sort of values we share and display in our lives, well, they can speak as loud as words, and very often they speak louder than words. What is the difference between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit? Well, there is one God, and he reveals himself in traditional Christian thinking um, in three ways. He's God the Father, God the Creator, the source of all life. Then there's Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus, we say, or I like to say, and many other Christians find this helpful to say, in Jesus, we see the human face of God, what God is like and what his values are. And we look at Jesus, not just what we're told he said, but we look at his life, uh, the way he lived, all at what it was that cost him his life. He who was faithful to those things, those values in which he believed, and faithful to God, whom he called his father. And I think the Holy Spirit is, is simply another way of saying that God is at work in the world 
and in our lives. It's God in action. And it's the spirit of Jesus alive and experienced by Christians. So we speak of this, uh, uh, the Holy Trinity, God who is both Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And Christians have been trying to get the right ways of explaining that for 2,000 centuries. <laughs> and I expect we'll carry on trying to explain it even better than has been done in the past. But don't forget, God also, uh, of course, speaks to us in um, different ways as well. He speaks to us through our conscience. He reveals himself and speaks to us through other people's words and through other people's actions. And he speaks to us in music. And he speaks to us in the creation around us. Why do I need to pray when God already knows the future and has a plan for us? Well, most of my prayers are thanksgiving prayers. Thankful for what has happened for this day and all my friends and my family and the simple things that... Uh, I've appreciated during the last 24 hours or during the last week, sometimes during the last year. So it's the simple things that are so important to my life, living and enrich my life. And I'm very much a person of prayer, but certainly I, I, I do just notice that I'm more thankful in my praying than, than asking, funnily enough. But I, I think my prayer or well, I think prayer, is my complete response to God. And if I think and pray about the future, I'm simply talking to God and sharing with him my plans and worries and hopes. Sometimes just in my thinking, sometimes I may utter words that other people can hear or not hear. I'm not worried. Sometimes I am just there silently, quietly, and perhaps just listening in my conscience uh, to him my plans for the future, today, tomorrow, next year, that they can change. And sometimes I might frustrate. And I want to learn more about Christian communities and how Christians help people. Well, of course, Christians, like others, want to change the world for the good, to put human dignity and respect for others, to value freedom. And people of other faiths and none want the same more often than not. But Christians have a responsibility to, and feel it quite deeply, to safeguard and in every way to value and give voice to integrity and trust, honesty, truth, excellence, love and hope, and to meet human needs as best we possibly can. We contribute, I think, by being faithful to these values and then, of course, sharing in the life of society. For instance, voting nationally and locally for those who are going to represent us, who make great decisions about our lives. Investing time and resources in schools and colleges and charities. A high proportion of Christians are heavily involved in charitable work. Sharing our time and skills in local community ventures, hospitals and hospices and trying to ensure that our churches are seen and used as far as possible as a resource for the community. Here, where I live, our church hosts concerts and organ recitals. It's open daily for visitors who want to explore its history. Some people come in to pray and have some peace and quiet. We have a mother and toddlers group and a meeting place for coffee and so on. And some churches are also used um, daily for community meals and craft workshops. And one of our churches has a badminton court in part of the building. So it's a question of us being involved in the life of society and ensuring that our buildings and uh, our communities are fully involved. As a Christian, what's your greatest achievement? Well... I guess you'd better ask other people, but I think I'm pleased that throughout my ministry in parishes and as archdeacon, I have been modestly successful in encouraging and seeing Christians everywhere involved in community life and seeing their buildings increasingly used as resources for their communities. So 
I think the word encouragement would be um, one of the key things that I hope people would see and feel and experience uh, in my ministry. When you pray, what do you pray about? Praying. What do I pray about? Praying for people I don't know. Well, I do pray for everyone. At the moment, I'm praying especially for the peoples of Ukraine. And indeed, at the moment, for everyone who's affected by COVID. And especially, of course, for yourselves in Hong Kong. And every Sunday, I pray for other nations in the world and their leaders and people I don't know, suffering through war or persecution, hunger or no health and no education. I pray for other people I know and activities and plans. I don't know exactly what my prayer does for them, but people are encouraged or tell me that they're encouraged to know that others are thinking and praying for them. And certainly I feel that when I hear that people have prayed for me. Of course, the answer really to some of my prayers is usually thrown back to me to do something about what I'm praying about, about that person or those needs. And then I wonder for a Christian, what, if any, is the difference between praying and thinking? So yet again, the big question is, what is prayer? And how would you describe God? I knew and indeed still know a Christian woman who was and is still a dancer, a very accomplished dancer. And she always said that her dancing was her prayer. You might like to think about that. How can I be a better Christian every day? What can I do to make the world a better place? Being about being a better Christian every day, I suppose, trying to recognize some of my failings, finding those moments when I might be more thoughtful, asking myself, there's a tag, WWJD, which is used by Christians in some parts of the world, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And some people apply that. But I think it's about every little step matters. And so one small and easy thing to make the world a better place. Well, it may be meeting the particular needs of the particular day. It may be a kind word. It may be a very helpful deed. It might actually be to be quiet and to be silent, to listen in a very, very noisy world. And by the same token, to be still in a very, very busy world. We all want justice and peace and well-being and hope for people throughout the world. But, you know, this can only come about through, I think, a thousand and more small actions in daily life. We're really, I think, called to be not blinding lights in the world, we're called to be candle lights for the world. And the thought of millions, hundreds of millions of little candles lighting up the world always appeals to me. You see, not many of us are going to be the big lights in the world. Not many of us are going to be the leaders of the great nations. Not many of us are going to walk the world stage. But it's important that if we do, we can make a contribution to the well-being of the world. But all of us, actually, are going to be living within our communities or families. We'll be engaged in places of work or school or our sports club or our other leisure activities. And that's, I think, where we can make a difference. And it'll be small things, almost routine things sometimes, but thinking about them and actually doing them. It'll be about, I think, the greatness of small actions. Think about that. The greatness of small actions. Think about this too. A different way of putting it. The significance of what appears to be insignificant. So it's about 
doing small things, a day at a time, a minute at a minute, doing, in, doing them in the best possible way one can. And again, it may be actions, but it may also be about words. Small is indeed beautiful. And I will have, I think, referred to that elsewhere in some of my responses. Thank you. Which is your favorite Bible verse and why? Well, I think I'd choose uh, my favorite verse from the Bible today as uh, Jesus' words, I have come that you may have life, life in all its fullness, from St. John's Gospel, chapter 10. And it's, um, well, it's of positive encouragement. It makes the fullest use of your life. Embrace life with all its ups and downs and everything to look forward to. And I will be with you. To be alive is the greatest gift. Use that life, your love, your skills, your time as best you can, not just for yourself, but for others. Open your eyes, open your ears, look at the world, listen to the voices of the world. Be thankful. Let your life be filled with wonder. And let me walk with you. I am beside you to support you. Ahead of you to lead the way. And behind you to help you when you're struggling. I know that um, on your school um, motto, I think, you have the words fides et virtus. Uh, Latin words. I'll give you two more Latin words. Carpe diem. Carpe diem diem seize the day and i think there's words of jesus i've come that you may have life life in its all its fullness embrace life seize the day make the most of this day make the most of one's life how many times have you read the whole bible well i've read the bible quite a bit <laughs> There are a few parts of the Old Testament that I haven't read, but I have read the New Testament so many times, but not all in one go. But as a priest for over 50 years, I've said my morning and evening prayer as a priest with selections from the Old Testament, but always with passages from the New Testament and especially of the Gospels. And I also read the Bible when I'm preparing a sermon or an address or, or just simply at random other moments when I want to be quiet. So I suppose I've read the New Testament hundreds of times and I've read some parts of the Old Testament hundreds of times too. But actually, I've never really counted. <laughs> What is the most important lesson you have learned from the Bible? Some important lessons from the Bible. Well, the stories from the Bible um, remind me of the strengths and weaknesses of what it is to be human. How in our stupidity sometimes we get things so wrong. We get our priorities, what's important in a muddle. But also, of course, we sometimes and very often do the right thing and the best things for ourselves and for others. And a story through the Old Testament in the Bible of people's strong belief in God and at other times forgetting him both as individuals and as a nation or as a community. What it is to be human with all its ups and downs. But the New Testament stories, above all, point to God in Jesus and his values, what we call kingdom values. And I think, what are the most important things in life, he's saying to us? What at the end of the day really matters? And the stories that and parables that Jesus tell us help us to think about this and make up our own minds. So often when Jesus is asked a question, he doesn't give a straight answer. He doesn't tell them exactly what to do. He says, look, I'll tell you a story. It's like this. 
Now you make up your own mind. Can you tell us your journey from a young Christian to the head of the church? And to say something about my journey as a Christian, I was brought up with uh, Christian parents and going to church and learning about Jesus uh, in a simple way. I took it all quite seriously. And of course, at school then, um, the Christian faith was uh, very much part of the curriculum. I was baptised as a baby and confirmed when I was 13. And like many teenagers, I then became a bit lazy about the church and started to think that it wasn't particularly important to me. But I was also full of some doubts and, and questions. But I came back to Christianity when I was about 20 and began to think seriously about it. And I wondered too if it might be that uh, God was encouraging me to think about being a priest. But actually, I resisted all this and outwardly say, no, not on your life. I'm not going to become a priest in the Church of England. But inwardly, I think I was saying, maybe. And I wondered about it and I toyed with, thought about being a lawyer. And then I thought about being in business. But neither of those professions were where I felt it was right for me to be. And after talking to a priest, he thought I should explore it all. And others in the church examined me and spoke with me and encouraged me and spent time with me. And eventually I was accepted and went back to college for three years. And then I was ordained a priest and I worked in several parishes. And after varied, very varied experiences, I was made an archdeacon. Uh, I was given an oversight of an area in a particular diocese. I was then made Archdeacon of um, Maidstone, which is in the area of the Diocese of Canterbury, but isn't the Archdeacon of Canterbury. I was made Archdeacon of Maidstone, and that gave me more responsibility, and I was working alongside the bishops. And I never had the ambition to be an Archdeacon. All I really wanted to be was a parish pastor, a parish priest, and to serve the church and God's people in that way. And then suddenly and totally unexpected, the Archbishop of Canterbury invited me to become Archdeacon of Canterbury. I was very surprised, but he and others told me that they had prayed and thought about it and asked people who knew me whether I might be suitable. And they'd all looked at my experiences, my competence, my personality, my pastoral gifts, my wisdom, or lack of it, my leadership gifts, and my faith, and, and much more. And they all came to the conclusion that at that time, for this particular post as Archdeacon of Canterbury, I was the right person. Ten years earlier, I might not have been, and ten years later, I might not have been. But at that moment, they thought I was the right person. So I thought and prayed about it, and then very nervously said yes. How could you define ministry and leadership? So ministry and leadership, well, ministry is for all of us, but the churches recognise that some are called to leadership ministry. And leadership is about vision. It's about values. It's about encouragement. It's about trust and integrity. It's about team building and supporting others. It's about helping others to develop. It's being prepared to take tough decisions. It's about being prepared to stand back and sometimes look at the big picture. Within the life of the church, it's about keeping close to Jesus. It's about being faithful in our prayers. It's about 
reading the Bible, being open to the story and experiences of the church over the centuries, but also looking to the future and seeking the best ways to build the kingdom. It's about a servant ministry. To lead is to serve and to serve is to lead. And I never forgot, forget that story about Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. That's servant ministry. And also reminds us that you have to bend low sometimes to see the glory of God. Ministry is a great calling. It's about service. How would you encourage more people to join Christianity? <laughs> I want people to see in the lives of Christians that our values, our behaviour, the way we talk and get on with people, that there is something good and attractive about being a Christian and even inspiring about our lives. But we also want to share our belief in God, in Jesus, and encourage others to think about belief, about Christianity. Also want to remind people that Christians are really quite normal human beings, but we have a distinctive outlook on life shaped by our faith. So we shouldn't be shy about being a Christian, but don't be boring either. Don't go on and on and on and on and on about Jesus and God. That just turns people away. I think it's about friendship. It's about kindness. It's about thankfulness. It's about a generosity of heart and mind and speaking. And sometimes, really, all we're doing is planting seeds, planting seeds of faith. Sometimes that's just all we can do. And the seeds will flourish, we hope, later on. Might be they'll flourish in a few months' time. Or perhaps when someone is very old. And they'll remember and think back. And remember some words or some action that somebody said years ago or months ago. Who knows? Of course, some seeds that we plant don't grow. And many of the many, many of the seeds we plant, we will never see. But others who come after us will see them. In that sense, there will be a harvest that we won't see, but others will. We all have one final difficult question. Why do we have to pray to God? Well, these uh, three final questions. Well, about prayer and praying to God. Well, we don't have to pray to God. Nobody, and certainly not God, orders us to pray. But Christians for over 2,000 years, in every part of the world, of every background, Christians have found that they want to pray, that in a sense they feel they need to talk to God, to listen to his voice, his voice speaking to them and to us through our conscience and in our questions too, in our doubts deep within us. We often need to see doubt as a friend, not always as an enemy to be overcome, sometimes faith will grow through our doubts and our thinking about things. But often in these prayers, it's better to just be still and quiet. Perhaps to think of a story or the words of Jesus, even just for a few minutes. Be thankful. And if you don't know what to say, thank you will probably be sufficient. Why hasn't God created human life on other planets? Well, 
human life on other planets. Wow. <laughs> well, of course, we're still exploring the universe and there may be surprises ahead. I bet there will be. Who knows what life may be beyond the planet Earth? There are many surprises ahead and we believe in a God of surprises. We need explorers, the oceans, the universe. So life on Earth is sustainable so far, but climate changes and plastics and all the rest of it, and so much more may yet ruin uh, Earth for future generations. So, okay, at the moment may be, but we're in a time perhaps of crisis. What the future of the universe will be, let alone planet Earth, who knows? So thank God for scientists and explorers. We need, you know, to be open to the future. There are some words of the playwright Shakespeare, whom you uh, will meet, I expect, in school, I expect before long, a great playwright in England. And the, some of his words are inscribed over the entrance to the National Archives, that's the Historical Records Building in Washington, in the United States. And Shakespeare wrote, What's past is prologue. That's written over the entrance to the National Archives. What's past is prologue. What he's saying is, what has happened is only the start. What's happened in the past is just the beginning. We may still be in the kindergarten or adolescence of Christianity and even of the universe. Perhaps we need to see things differently. I'm almost 80 years young. How young are you? There's so much ahead of us. Who knows what God has in store and to surprise us in the future. How do you know God is real? Well, God and Jesus are real to me. I feel, I believe, the gift of faith that God is real and I experience him in my life. Sometimes I find that difficult to describe to other people. I can't prove that he is real. I can't see him or touch him or listen to him, literally, as I might with other human beings. So I can't prove that he's real. I could argue and debate with others how real God is or the reality of God, but even that debate only takes us so far. But he is real to me. And he has been and is real to millions of Christians in history and all over the world now. The gift of life in every form in the natural world and human life. The gifts of love and truth and peace and justice and freedom and the wonder of it all and the wonder and mystery of, imag of imagination and memory and all that it is that makes our living valuable, that also makes human life so fragile. But the gift of faith in God is real to those who place their trust in him. And that is their experience and my experience. So thank you so much for the invitation to join you. It's been great to meet you and to offer just a few thoughts to your brilliant questions. It sounds as though you have a wonderful school. Perhaps we will meet again in real life. I might one day visit Hong Kong or you might come to England or we'll meet on the screen again. May God bless you all and thank you. Thanks so much for your time today and joining us for our In the Spotlight.
live show. It's been really helpful and we hope to inspire a new generation of Christians that contribute our community and make society a better place. Best wishes and God bless.